Welcome, welcome everybody to this event. My name is Eric Korsvik Østergaard and along with Puk and Tor and Martin and Martin, we have created Good Morning April, where we look into the future. We try to explore and evaluate the possible futures. And since we are Good Morning April, of course, we need an event in April. And today we give to you our horizon scanning document. We have spent the past four months looking into the horizon, not to understand what is going on currently, not the current trends, but we look into the, to the horizon to see what signals are there of possible futures that might affect you. We have spotted nine of these signals and we're giving them to you today. And today we will, in this event, there will be two parts. One part will be a, uh, an interview session where we have uh, three guests giving their perspectives on some of these signals. And then we have a Q&A session. And in the YouTube chat, we highly recommend and encourage you to react with emojis and with comments and also with questions. Because afterwards, there will be a link also in the chat inviting you over to the Q&A session where we will dive into some of the questions, maybe not all of them, but those that we find are uh, fitting and suitable and representative of what we have been talking about. So that's what we're going to talk about today. There will be the interviews and then the Q&A session. Afterwards, afterwards, you will get an email with access to the document. The document consists both of the signals that we describe. It's also a tool that helps you actually use the signals. And then there are scenarios where we describe what possible futures that we might see that might unfold over the next years. So you'll get access to the document. You will also get, get access to this recording afterwards. And you can find every resource, the document and the videos in links uh, at our website. I think that's it. So uh, get yourself your cup of coffee and let's go. Good morning, April. Welcome to our very first April day. My name is Tor, and uh, this is our unveiling of the Futures of Work Horizon Scanning Document 2022. Uh, we look very much forward to sharing with uh, you all who have joined this event. Um, this document where we have gathered signals and trends from the future, which uh, we believe might have a very interesting impact in the way we work. During this on Wheeling, we will of course uh, provide you with a download link for this document, so you can uh, examine and explore it uh, at home. We will also have three interviews with uh, three different guests, and we will have a Q&A session with, where you all have the opportunity to uh, ask questions about this horizon scanning document. And we at Good Morning April with, uh, will try and provide you with our perspectives on these questions. So our three guests that we will interview today are Susanne palstein Bukart. She's the vice president at Novozymes. We also have Jasmina Kles, who is head of entrepreneurship at the Danish Chamber of Commerce. And we have Carsten Beck, who is director of research at the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. I am super excited to get started and to hear the perspectives our guests have on the signals that we have presented to them. Uh, I hope you are as well. Uh, if you are, you're very welcome to let us know in the chat uh, on this live feed. So let's get going. First up is Susanne, Vice President at Novozymes. Susanne uh, has a keen interest in both people and technology and has a progressive approach to new ways of working. The signals Susanne has chosen to discuss are uh, signal number one, employees take control of hybrid work, and signal number seven, extreme localization of cultures in organizations. So uh, let's hear what Susanne has to say. So, <laughs> Susanne, <laughs> Susanne, 
Which of these signals do you find interesting in your role in your organization? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, as you know, I am personally very passionate about delivering impact through sustainable leadership. Mm. So from my current environment, the signals that speak the most to me are uh, the one about employees taking an active role in a hybrid context. Mm -hmm. And then I actually relate that very much to the uh, subcultures, but we can uh, come back to that. So if we talk about the first one, about, you know, we have been through the past two years of COVID, mm -hmm. which in, you know, to a very large degree has opened up for all of us, including myself, that there's a different way to conduct work. Uh, and as an organization, we need to offer something different. So I think everybody is at a point where already now, you can say we are offering this mix of ways that you can be uh, engaging with the employees, some uh, or with, with the workplace. Some have to be full-time because that's the nature of the job. Some can work hybrid, some work completely remote. And that's what we're doing today. But that's something that we, as an organization, as a corporation, is has offered and kind of put upon our employees. And what I think is really interesting about this signal is that that's a change in the fact that now it's the employees that we are trying to attract or retain who are saying, I want something else. Mm. I want, that's at least how I read the signal. I want to work from Costa Rica three months a year. I want to, you know, not work uh, or work when it suits me and not in the work time that you have defined. And that we as an organization are not ready for today. And that is both from a cultural point of view and from a more practical point of view. You see, that, that is exactly what we are seeing that mm. the past two years, in a lockdown situation, the organizations have been driving the way that the hybrid work has been embraced. We do this, we have these platforms, uh, this is the way that we meet up. But now we see the shift to the other side where it's the employees taking the agenda and, and, and saying how we want to have that. How can you prepare, for example, your organization, your, your processes, your touch points, your decision processes for embracing that? Yeah, and that's where uh, I think the other signal uh, comes into play about subcultures. Mm -hmm. Because I think what is very much at stake, if you kind of take for granted that the type of work that you're doing can actually be done anywhere, anytime. That's not everything that we do in normal times, but you can say a large part of what we do, including my own job, can actually be done anytime, anywhere. Mm -hmm. But it requires coordination, it requires collaboration. And if you're going to stay and be loyal to the company and the and the people that you work with, it, in my mind, requires a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, the starting point, there's a practical part of it around employee uh, rules and engagement contracts. Uh, I think those things we can talk about another time. I think the more interesting aspect is the cultural and leadership part of this. So I think, I think the first thing is it requires a complete, uh, I would say almost upgrade of the mindset of us as leaders in terms of what is our role as leaders, if we're not here to define when and how work takes place, but we're here to set the direction, create a sense of purpose, and more importantly, create a sense of belonging so that when you can shop around any time, any place, you choose to work for me or for the mission that we are on in Novozymes. And that's where I think the other signal about cultures or subcultures comes into play, because I think that will be immensely important mm. to be able to attract people to actually want to work on this mission, on this team. And that is not necessarily signing into the overall purpose of what we're doing in Novozymes or what we're doing in agriculture and industrial biosolutions, my division, but it's about what mission are we on? Are you able to articulate that? Are you able to allow for a culture where the type of skills, the type of people that you need right now are actually attracted to that environment? They can see themselves working. You have the right team, competences, diversity in that team. It's for a period of time. It's not necessarily permanent. That we are not ready for. And we're not, you know, starting with us as leaders, we're not ready for that. The mm -hmm. mental model is I hire you. I, you have a job description. You are here for actually until you or I choose to resign the termination. So this kind of fixed mindset about how we work, there's a defined role, there's a defined job description, changing that into we're on a project, we're on a mission, we're to solve a task. You know, and for that, we are engaging together. Mm -hmm. And if you want to stay, I have to offer something you know, representing the company. Also, if I, as an employee, I'm employed myself, want to stay, there's something different I want from the organization than what I'm getting today. And I think personally, 
that it's leadership and culture that will make the difference about whether you choose to be engaged with one or the other, uh, so to speak. So that, that signal is about, or we call it extreme localization of mm -hmm. cultures. Yes. And it's a flip going away from, maybe you at one point had this cultural program called One Novozymes or One Siemens or One Erster or something like that that alluded to that we, we needed uh, some kind of homogeneous culture. Mm -hmm. and what you're talking about and what we can see in the signals is that this is, we, we are, we are we're embracing nuances, we're embracing dialects in order to exactly, as you say, to attract people, to make it relevant very, very locally. Mm -hmm. So what kind of leadership does that require? Because I would imagine that the leadership also will have dialects when it comes to actually creating that subculture. Yes. Let me answer it in two ways, because I think, as you say, we're moving away from this, uh, you know, uniform one culture, you know, four values, uh, we still have that. Uh, but what I think is the, the, I think it's actually there already. I think the subcultures are there. If I look at our company, there are naturally tribes or sense of belongings, but today it's just happening, you can say, kind of as a movement uh, towards the one size fits all, but it's already there. So I think the change will be, how do we then build on what is already there? We accept and ac accelerate or accentuate that that is actually what we want, is this these subcultures within a certain set of behaviors. Because I actually think that there, there is a difference between, or and it's also moral and ethics, around you know, how we as a company behave. So if you are associated, in this case, to the Novozymes brand, there's a certain set of values and behaviors that we accept or tolerate. Those are you know, not up for discussion. Within those frames, go crazy in your subcultures and as you say, we will have leaders who are you know, super entrepreneurial and very good at building business. We'll have people who are super meticulous and very good at driving um, detailed uh, cost out or manufacturing, etc. So, so it's about first embracing that diversity of leadership, recognizing, recognizing we have different roles. Uh, we have a different uh, task at hand. So again, we are not uniform as leaders. Collectively, we're hopefully delivering on the journey that we are on, doubling the impact of the company. Uh, but you could say as, as an organization, I think we are quite far from, uh, again, embracing and kind of tolerating that there are differences. And it feels different when you go to one part of the building or from one floor to the other. And that is OK. That is on purpose because they are on one mission, we are on another. And how do you then nurture and attract the people that are the best for solving that task? That I think we are. You've been to our location. Mm -hmm. It looks very uniform. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and you can say right now we have to change the way we work, the way we lead, uh, and the, what we put emphasis on when we go to work, is it that you fit in or is it that you bring curiosity, diversity, push us to see the world in a different way? And I think that will be even more important. Uh, you can say as more and more work get uh, automized uh, and you can say what we, what we bring as humans mm. is perspectives, challenges, questions. That's what the human brain is fit for. Uh, and, and you can say all the standard work goes away. So we have to allow for that creativity and create spaces where that can happen. So, I think. so when you when you look across the the value chain from R and D to scale up to products to sales to finance, you will end up with a number of local dialects of the of the culture. What's the risk in that? Mm. Huge risk and uh, huge responsibility. So back to the, you know, the leader's role uh, already today is actually connecting and seeing, I think you call it brokerage, uh, and brokering the, the tension between those tribes. So I think the risk is that you have an, an atomization of the organization, which the, where then the sense of belonging diminishes. Mm -hmm. So you actually don't understand why, why do we have to be part of this? Can't we just branch out? I think we see that already today. Uh, a lot of people leaving corporates because mm -hmm. they don't get what they want in these two signals. And then it's easier to go out, find in, in a world of abundant uh, capital, you can easily go out and get your idea funded and you rally around 25 people in a startup where you feel much higher sense of belonging. I think mm. that is a major risk. And I think there's a lot of money in getting the retention part right. So, you know, why am I as a business leader interested? That's because I think there's a super large business case in both retaining 
and attracting the right talent. And we have, you can say, the experience, we have the capital to make it happen. So mm. how do you make it attractive to stay? And how do you, as a leader, facilitate that you do get healthy tension, competition, friction between the tribes, but at the same time, you facilitate that they actually collaborate because everybody is needed mm. to get the maximum out of it. And that, I, I think, will be a real, not a risk, but at least a challenge. Mm. So, so how can we how can we get the organization together to shape the future they want to be part of? How can we mitigate that risk? How can we embrace all the differences and, and the nuances? How how can we do that? Mm, I think the first thing is starting to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, embracing that we are on a journey and they are on the journey with us, and we actively want them mm -hmm. to help shape us. So so you know it's not something new, but you can say ask people and engage them and saying, you know, if this is what we're seeing, you know, the the, the, the signals that you are uh, sending out, uh, releasing today, I want everybody in my organization to read that. Mm. And then I want them to talk about which ones, just as you asked me, which ones speak to you. Mm. I'm sure there's others that speaks more to them. Uh, and how do we then as a company, so we start a movement, not driven by you know, me as the leader, but the team and saying, this is what we like. We would like to shape it this way. I have these needs. How can we accommodate it? So I think it's it's the classical, you know, through dialogue, through co-creation, through engagement by giving the autonomy and the responsibility for them to also shape the future and not just either wait for something to come from corporate mm -hmm. uh, because then we know it won't hit what they, what they want or uh, leave because they don't see a way forward. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things that I'm trying to to balance and to mm. mitigate in my uh, job. But I think the first thing is creating awareness, having a mindset where you are actually actively looking for what's coming and also embracing that and saying, we want to change. We need to change to stay at the forefront. Help us mm. do that. And don't expect that I have all the answers because I don't. <laughs> I think neither of us have the answers. Mm. But experimenting with this, as you said, mm -hmm. download the document, dive into it very, very locally, not only on a, on a corporate level, but in your business, unit, in your team, yeah. play around with it. And uh, as leaders around you, uh, embrace that now we are trying something, we are building local dialects of the culture, local dialects of what we do, and we try to shape the way forward locally. I think that's a way forward. Yeah. Susanne uh, quickly saw a opportunity to use the signals from the horizon scanning document to actually give input with her team to uh, explore their ways of working. So now we've heard how uh, the signals uh, might influence or how they can be used in a more corporate setting. Now we shall hear how it might uh, be used in a startup world. We have uh, an interview with Jasmina Pless, who is head of entrepreneurship at the Danish Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Jasmina has chosen uh, two signals that she would like to explore. The first one is uh, signal number five, cobots and augmented collaboration. And uh, signal number six, corporate activism from the top. So uh, let's hear what Jasmina has to say. When you look at these signals that we have gathered, which one do you think is most important for the, for the startup organizations to consider? I think it's very important to, one of the, the signs that I really liked that you have pointed out is um, in relation to cobots mm. and uh, collaboration um, in between augmented reality and uh, new technologies in general. And I think that it's really important for the startup world especially because they, the startups, they can build these components as the core of their company. They can look into some new technologies that the big corporations might not have um, the, the, the knowledge and know-how or the energy to spend on, on these new technologies. But that's what, where the startups come in and they build these new technologies that they can then uh, collaborate with the big corporations and um, maybe sell these products to the big corporations. So one thing is to build the cobots. How do these startups get the, the information to design them? 
Um, I think a lot of the startups that we see that who build uh, cobots and augmented reality uh, for big corporations, um, they, they get inspiration from their daily life and from the problems that they see. And they can act on new trends much faster than big corporations. Um, some um, examples that we that we know here from Denmark is uh, is for example a company called Radiobotics, and they they built like this AI a component where they look at um, radiologist photos, and then they um, they build a machine that can then help the, the radiologist the doctors on um, giving a really, really good estimate on what's, what the, what's the problem with, the, with this knee or whatever um, photo they're looking at. So it is really interesting that you point out the, the collaboration maybe between the, the bigger corporates and the smaller startups. How can, how can the, these two worlds uh, collaborate? I think that's probably one of the most important things that startups can do, that is uh, to create um, products that can that can work in collaboration with the big corporations because that's where we we can really change um, the ways that we we work in society and um, because the big corporations are obviously those companies that have a big impact on the world and when the startups can come in with new technologies and new components that's when we can push um, new trends even faster forward um, when we can. Make the uh, make the new technologies from the startups collaborate with the big organizations and big co um, uh, companies. So, with, with a possible multitude, with a with a number of possible futures that we can look into, who actually plays the most vital role in that? Is that the the startups who get the ideas and make the prototypes, or the big corporates who can take that into? Uh, the regulated areas and, and scale it up? Who actually drives the futures? I think both drives the futures. Um, the startups drives the futures by, um, by creating and getting the ideas for the new products and new technologies. But um, the big corporations, they have a really, really big imp impact as well because they are the ones who need to have an open mind and to take in these new technologies. It's, it's probably the easiest for a big organization or a big company to just avoid any noise from yeah. smaller companies and and just move forward with the, those old technologies that they've always been using. But um, so it, it takes a lot for the big companies to have an open mind and to create the infrastructure in the big organizations to take in these technologies. And often it's a matter of trying the new technologies out and sometimes failing um, and testing it. Uh, it might not be the, a, a perfect fit to begin with. So it takes uh, risk and it takes um, curiosity from the big corporations to check out these technologies from the startups. And that's that co collaboration is what is driving the future forward. I can easily see that you in your role is a, is a gift with all, also with all the people that you work here for the entrepreneurship, for the Thank startup you. environment. <laughs> But how do you actually help the big corporates? How do you facilitate that, that cooperation? Because I can easily imagine that for an, a, a big corporate to actually pause and look at the, the startups and, and start, start collaborating will be hmm, a hindrance for them. Absolutely. It's a big hindrance for uh, the big corporations if they don't have the infrastructure yet in order to collaborate with the startups. What we try to do is um, inspire the big corporations. That's probably the best thing we can do. Uh, we can take the good examples from some corporates that's been good at creating these collaborations. Um, I've looked into various ways that big corporations can um, collaborate with startups. Like one, of, one example is that you can uh, simply open up, make it like your own uh, infrastructure in the company that basically have like an email address that isn't info at mm -hmm. novoscience.com. Um, but you have like uh, a point of departure where uh, the startups can enter uh, or a, yeah, an entry point for the startups. Um, so it can be like an innovation lab, for example, or just some people who are, um, who are capable of grabbing these new ideas and implementing them and selling them uh, to the, the right departments in the company. It can also be creating uh, a corporate venture fund. Mm -hmm. So investing directly into startups that often has something to do with that specific 
a specific field that the big corporation is working with, then they invest into these companies and probably use that technology in their own company in one way or another. And that kind of ecosystem, is that something that you see trending? Is that new or is that established already? Absolutely. I think especially corporate venture capital, which is these venture funds owned by corporates are called, um, that's a huge trend that we can see especially in America, especially in the UK, but also in Denmark. We see a lot more um, big companies who invest in startups, sometimes to yeah gain a profit, but just as much to get access to this to new technology. Because I think we're all seen, and, and the, the, the management of large corporations has also, they've seen how uh, you need to develop, you need to evolve and uh, focus on the new technologies and take it in because otherwise you're going to be run over by new technologies and you're going to be obsolete in the future. So it's really great to see that a lot of big corporations is taking this uh, the technological development serious and wanting to uh, engage and interact with new technologies, with the technologies from the startups. Um, and that ov obviously helps the startups as well because often they are... Um, they need the big corporations to mm. test their products. If it's a product that, that needs to be tested together with a, a big company, then they need someone to take that risk to begin with. So it's, yeah, it's just all about beautiful collaboration, really. Uh, we need, we need uh, risk and action from both sides. <laughs> beautiful collaboration. I, I, I really like that. How, how is the Danish startup scene different compared to the other startup scenes that you meet? I think we're lucky in Denmark that we we always talk about like the flat hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And I think that also, that's also really important when it comes to collaboration between startups and corporates. Um, I think it's much easier for a startup, despite it being difficult. It's tr uh, it's uh, Despite that, it's e easier in Denmark to get access to the right people. That's often the problem, to get access to the right person sitting in that right department in the in the big company. Um, and I think that's uh, easier in Denmark because it's, we're a small country and maybe you know someone who knows someone or you can find them on LinkedIn and they want to drag, uh, they want to drink a coffee with you. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's, that's a plus. And, uh, what, what I is, what I'm really happy that we see at the moment is big, uh, companies coming to me wanting to, collaborate with startup, wanting to get these new ideas. And that makes it, of course, a lot easier for me to link uh, the startups with the big companies mm -hmm. uh, because the startups are often very eager to meet the big companies. But what we've been missing is is the eagerness from the big companies to to uh, yeah, to engage with the startups. And and that is new uh, over the past how how many ten years? years, ten years probably new over the last ten years yeah mm. that we we see an active engagement from the big companies in wanting to explore new technologies within their field um, and seeing how they can make sure that they stay relevant and implement new technologies so they can stay competitive. And it's interesting that you point out that time frame because as I see it as looking into the possible futures and, and scanning the trends and signals, there's definitely something going on or has been going on over the past 10 years, especially driven by technology. Looking at the signals right now, uh, we see that it, it's both driven by technology and society. Can you feel that? That it, it's not only technology driven, that staying relevant to the market is also something about people? Absolutely. Uh, I think if we look at um, one of your other trends that you point out, corporate activism from the top, I yeah. think that's super relevant as well. Um, it, it's something where we, we see uh, a need not only for wanting new technologies, but also staying relevant for society. Mm -hmm. um, I think if we look back 10 years, for example, most companies could stay um, behind the scenes. They could just do their little business, run everything um, with a corporate mindset of um, making shareholders happy and live a happy life like that. Uh, today, that doesn't work that way anymore. We have so many movements within society and the lines between um, the, your corporate life and your private life has become more intertwined. And um, 
uh, trends such as uh, Me Too and uh, staying, uh, ma making sure you have a good CSR strategy, staying uh, on top of climate focus. Um, all these trends are super important for the employees, mm -hmm. which makes it important for the employers as well and for the management of the companies. So the business of business is not only business. It's also making sure that uh, uh, the society is taken care of and that you, you have a position maybe in the p political landscape also? Absolutely. It's very important for companies nowadays, at least to a higher degree, to be political relevant. Uh, and I think where in back in the days you didn't have to um, necessarily engage in politics, but now you don't really have the choice mm -hmm. of not engaging. Mm -hmm. um, so we both see probably the management being pushed into uh, engaging in the society and the political life. But uh, we just as much see um, that they, they're probably uh, wanting to engage in the political life more, more often than mm -hmm. before. Um, I think we see more uh, CEOs and more people from the management engaging in political causes that may have some relevance to their business, but mm -hmm. maybe not. It could also be that we see uh, the management engaging in, in uh, well, I guess saving the climate is relevant for all of us, but it might not be relevant for one particular company, but then the CEO can still have some idea or some values uh, that are driven towards this, this course and wanting to engage in, in uh, political actions within this field. Mm -hmm. Or it can be um, wanting to uh, help entrepreneurs. Like we see some, uh, CEOs from large com companies that maybe because they started their business uh, many years ago and being an entrepreneur, they want to give back to society and then they engage in, in helping um, young entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs. And I think that's really interesting to see that that's a political course as well or a CSR course, depending on how you look at it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's uh, important nowadays that that the management engage and take um, take a stand in society mm. and have a voice, and we see that trending more and more. So you you pulled out two of these signals. How do you think a small startup could, in the best possible way, engage in these signals? How how, how should or how could they use this gathering of signals? I think it's um, it's it's super important for startups to stay aware of how society is changing and the signals that we see from the future. Uh, and probably uh, the startups have an, that, that advantage that they can more easily act on these signals. Whereas big companies, they would probably have to have a big strategy, like some five year plan or something, uh, and, and probably be a lot of money for a consultancy to create this plan um, <laughs> or strategy. Um, and so they, they act a lot a lot slower mm -hmm. on trends, whereas startups, they can much more easily act on, on new trends that we're seeing, or even micro trends, something that's trending for season or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's something that startups can much easier act on than corporates. So that gives the startups a competitive advantage on staying super relevant um, for the future. That I can easily see that startups has the agility to change the technology or the course of the product or, or product line. But some of the startups that I meet, they, they are, their bandwidth is just filled with, with customers and with sales and with, with cash flow and not having necessarily the time to also reflect and change courses based on like these signals. How, how can you help them in that? That's that's right. Of course, um, you when you're running your company, you have that to focus on as your primary focus. Um, but I think many many uh, many a lot of the management in these startups they are quite good at um, looking at the trends in society mm -hmm. and acting on it. But as, that's for sure. Here at the Chamber of Commerce, we also help startups. Um, coming in and hearing new, about new trends or rewrite about new trends. And in that way, they, uh, they can get inspiration mm -hmm. for the future. That was a very good point, uh, Jasmina had, that uh, you can actually look at many of these signals um, and flip them around where some of the signals illuminate uh, 
problems. Uh, as an entrepreneur, you, you usually uh, have to see opportunities and uh, possibly business cases for uh, potential startups. Now it's time to hear from Carsten. Carsten is the director of research at Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. And Carsten is a real futurist with over 30 years of experience in this field and a good friend of Good Morning April. We have asked Carsten um, how you all tuning in right now can use the horizon scanning document uh, in a more practical sense in your specific context. So let's hear what Carsten has to say. You've heard now from Susanne and from Jasmina. Susanne talked about signals and corporations and how they can contribute. And Jasmina looked into the startup world. But maybe the watchers of this event is asking themselves, but how can I use the signal? How, how can I get going? What's my approach? So do you have maybe suggestions and strategies on how to get going from here? Yeah, that's a very good question. First of all, I would say it's, it's about... Uh, uh, a mental capacity in organizations. Uh, it's act about actually realizing that we need to look for signals. Sometimes, uh, if you look to the internal workings of organizations, uh, the everyday life is so busy, there's so much to do, there's so much on everybody's plate, that you forget not only about signals uh, that might be sort of right here, right now, uh, but you also forget about uh, the future. So, so for us uh, at SIFS, the first thing is actually to be aware that this is on our plate. And, and um, uh, then you can ask, okay, but whose plate is it actually? Is it, is it the management team? Is it the CEO? Is it you and me as employees? Uh, that's a very good and also very, very <laughs> difficult uh, question to, um, to answer. But, but b based on that, when you have this uh, mentality, uh, I would say the next step is also kind of mental. It is to have an open approach, uh, okay. to, um, uh, to reach out and to listen to uh, all kinds of voices in your organization. It could be internally, uh, people working for you, it could be uh, suppliers, it could be customers, it could be uh, regulatory uh, the, uh, people and, and politicians, uh, but really to have this multitude of, of people delivering uh, the signals. And, and whether the signals are qualitative, I feel this, or I would like that, or it's more sort of quantitative, where you can say, okay, but 70% of our employees Whatever. want yeah. uh, X. Okay, mm -hmm. doesn't really uh, matter whether it's, it's other or... Uh, but, but to realize we need to do this mm -hmm. and to have an open uh, approach. And then actually, if I can just continue with the mental thing, <laughs> Uh, also, uh, to realize that um, uh, to make forecasts about the medium-term future, of course, is a very, very difficult business. And, and I mean, can you really forecast anything in the world as we see it now? That's probably questionable. Uh, so, so to be able to, in your organization, to discuss a multitude of scenarios and narratives is also a very, very uh, good idea. Uh, and it's easy uh, for me to sit here and talk to you about it. It's extremely difficult to do in real life. Mm -hmm. So I imagine that uh, we have some sort of team mixed from leaders, employees, those voices you talk about. We have the, the uh, mental capacity and, and time for it. Mm -hmm. And then we take the signals, the future of X, the future of our industry, combined with maybe the future of work or the future of urban planning or whatever you mm -hmm. want to mix with. All these signals, cut them out, put them on the table, yeah. and go through them, look at them, yeah. maybe sort them. What is uh, of high impact? What is of low impact? Exactly. And relevance? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, once again, it would be so nice to have this set of rules <laughs> uh, when you do this exercise. And once again, whether you do it uh, sort of uh, on the back of an envelope or you do it in, in a real true process. Uh, but, but I think the rules differ from, from, from each individual uh, case. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you would like to cluster the trends. Uh, you would like to see sort of patterns uh, emerging from weak signals as, as well as uh, strong signals. You would also like, in, in most cases, both to have uh, the short-term perspective, which most organizations do have. I mean, okay, what do we do tomorrow, eh? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, because if you have serious issues, uh, things that are not working, things that are off track in the present, then it's, it's even more difficult to, to discuss about the future because, okay, but we all know here in, at our company, 
we have why and why is a big problem, uh, <laughs> whatever it is. So you both need to have a focus on, okay, solving short-term uh, things could also be positive for the organization, obviously. Uh, and then at the same time, look at, uh, at the medium to, um, uh, to, to long-term. Uh, and, and, and make the clustering in the end, make scenarios, look at w what is important for your organization for attracting talents or retaining people or whatever have we. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and then having the guts to also discuss uh, questions that are difficult for the organization. I can tell you, I was uh, uh, at a company last week in uh, the northern part of Zealand, a very uh, big company and, and well known here in, in, in Denmark. And we discussed young people. And uh, I mean, young people, they tend to live in, in urban city centers. And uh, how can you attract if, if you are maybe uh, I mean, Denmark, small country, eh? yeah. but but if you are maybe 25, 30, 35 kilometers from the city center of Copenhagen with all this young talent, what does that actually mean for the company uh, at hand? Is, is is this something we should just accept? It's difficult, they, they don't want to come here. Mm -hmm. Or should we try to uh, train, uh, change some parameters? Um, so some of the, the questions are, are easy and fun and, and it's full of opportunity mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and some of them are very very difficult and, 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 and can sort of almost sort of hurt the organizational DNA. Yeah okay so two questions here. Uh, the first one is when you look at that medium to long term uh, do you then go out into the future and looking back trying to put yourself what is the future how, how could this scenario be like and looking back mm -hmm. on how to get there? Could you do so? Or? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. yeah that, that's, that's a very good um, uh, methodology. Uh, sort of projects uh, into an, uh, a number of scenarios, mm -hmm. uh, obviously. But then to, to okay, analyze what has, has taken us into this specific scena uh, scenario, what, what were sort of the key drivers, what, what enabled us to, to, to go there, mm -hmm. and also maybe looking at some of the resistance uh, mm -hmm. uh, getting there. And just like you say, I think it's a wonderful idea by, uh, not in the beginning of the process, but in the process to say, okay, but 10 years from now, what could actually happen? Sometimes I, I've seen, um, and I've seen many of these processes, <laughs> sometimes you start the other way around. So you say, okay, we're here in 2022, next year, this and this will happen, next year, this and this and this will happen. Du -dum -du 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 -dum. The problem with that uh, process is if your prediction, so to speak, for next year is wrong, Mm. Uh, maybe you give an example, you, you tell a story around it, and this example turns out to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Then the rest falls like dominoes in people's minds. Uh, okay, you were wrong the first time, you're not uh, right the second and third year, and, and you might be. So it's, it's much better to, to say, okay, what if this scenario came through, mm -hmm. and then uh, start to, uh, to backtrack. Yeah, because from what I understand, it's not about being right in the scenarios. It's no. about imagining them and yeah. figuring out what would this scenario consist of in our context. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's, um, and, uh, and I mean, unfortunately here in 2022, we, we, we live in a time of extreme scenarios. Uh, we have the awful war going on and um, uh, we also had Corona. And uh, the, uh, I mean, when I, I talk to, 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 to our clients, uh, they always ask me, okay, but Corona, did you not see it? Did you not? Uh, <laughs> come on, Carsten. Uh, and then, I say to them, yeah, we don't really track that at SIFS, but we have, we have uh, good uh, colleagues around the world that do these uh, do make these uh, risk catalogs mm -hmm. on impact and uncertainty. And, and there you could certainly see pandemics yeah. uh, in the catalogs. The only problem was in that same catalog, you had maybe 50 other things that could happen. Yeah. And then you should sit there as a politician or as a CEO and you go, Wow, uh, <laughs> what do I do with this? <laughs> yeah. uh, so it is about having the conversation. It is about, and, and, and there's a lot of, 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 of cliches uh, mm. around these uh, things, agility, resilience, uh, all of yeah, that, yeah. but they're actually true. Uh, I mean, we cannot predict uh, in the medium to uh, long term. We can, we, we can look at the mega trends, as we call them here at SIFS. And the mega trends, I would say, uh, you and I should meet 10 years from now, and I can <clears throat> almost guarantee you <laughs> that the vast majority of the megatrends will have uh, been important 
mm-hmm. uh, in this period of uh, of time. But the consequences, uh, of course, is always uh, debatable. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a discussion on sustainability right now in, in all our countries and climate and how that will affect markets and societies and, and mindsets and consumption and all of that. Mm-hmm. And I am sure when, when we meet 10 years from now that uh, you and I will say to each other, yes, sustainability was really maybe even the dominant trend. But the outcome, the actual uh, uh, strategies that were changed mm-hmm. in this period of, of time we could not foresee that. We could not predict it would be this and this and this. Yeah. And that actually leads me back to my second question from previous, when you mentioned the scenarios of attracting young talent outside of Copenhagen. Mm. So when you've made those different scenarios of maybe we can do a shuttle bus and drive them back and mm, forth, maybe we, idea, give, yeah. we give them their own <coughs> car, or maybe we move yeah. the company, or maybe we only do remote, you know, yeah. all those scenarios, then what is the next step? How do you how do you make I don't know actions or strategies based on the scenarios? How yeah. do, how do you work with that? Yeah, uh, the, the strategy part is actually uh, two faced uh, as I see it. It is first of all to look at uh, robust strategy elements. So if you have a number of scenarios or, or maybe a number of trends, to look at robustness and say, okay, what uh, is at the core here in, mm-hmm. in our company or in our organization, our country? Uh, and and the core elements of of the strategy that we are working on is that actually robust in all four scenarios. That, that for me would be a, a first uh, step, and then a second step would be um, somewhere down the line, some leaders uh, in organizations or in society they need to make uh, priorities mm-hmm. uh, and. As you start to prioritize what is important in our organization, you always um, see that that some of the scenarios, uh, I wouldn't say they become more likely, uh, but but the insights you gain from certain scenarios might turn out to be more important than the insights you gain from other scenarios. Mm. And then uh, uh, you start to to uh, make, make your strategy, you start to look at the t- tactical and operational uh, level. Um, and when it comes to the uh, the, the example of, of, of young talents. Yeah, I would try with the bus. Uh, <laughs> I, I was at a conference in um, in Jutland uh, last summer uh, where we looked in, in a certain municipality in, in the western part of Jutland, mm-hmm. Denmark. Uh, young people were leaving this part of uh, Jutland and, oh, crisis, crisis, what do we do? And um, then they actually had some scientists from uh, Aalborg University looking into, okay, these young people that left this part of Denmark, where did they go? Mm. And if everybody went to London or, or Silicon Valley or Berlin, okay, difficult. Yeah, yeah. It turned out most of these young people, they went to the neighboring municipalities. Oh. And then you start talking about the bus. Yeah. Okay, then we can just get a bus back and forth, back and forth. Then you can stay here. And if you have a party or girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever you have it in your yeah. town uh, over there, then we increase the bus service. Yeah. Uh, it's as simple as that. Is that enough? Probably not. <laughs> but but it's it's a good example of, of, yeah. of testing things out. Yeah. And that could be one strategy to yeah, exactly. make that scenario more likely or yeah, test exactly. it out. As yeah, you yeah, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes um does not go for all organizations, but for some. Um, sometimes you actually can influence your future. Sometimes, I, I'm not saying you and I can can stop the war or, or change corona or anything like that. But, but uh, if you are in a market or you are a municipality or the minister of something in, in a country here in Europe, you actually do have power. You mm. can influence uh, things. So also there you can use uh, scenarios uh, to sort of stress test your uh, ideas. Um, and I think it links back to the first thing you said of having an open mind and look at exactly. the sin- signals yeah. and, and saying, yes, I do prioritize the time to actually look at this. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's never the right time, I can tell you. <laughs> it's never the right time. There's always a crisis. There's always some part of the organization where things are falling a little bit to pieces and we are not on top of things or we can't attract as we talked about. Uh, so so you, have to, um, you, have to, you have to have this mental step. That was three different perspectives on the signals and I hope you all tuning in uh, got some inspiration on how to apply these signals, how to use them uh, in your context. Uh, you uh, can now access the document uh, at our homepage, goodmorningapple.com. Uh, and of course, you will also receive an email 
uh, where a link will be provided to the document. And you will also have access to these uh, interviews uh, in the email. Now it's time to uh, our last segment. We will uh, guide you to where our Q&A uh, is. Uh, a link will be provided in the chat. And uh, if you follow that, my colleagues at Good Morning April uh, and myself will be ready to uh, hear your uh, perspectives on the signals and also answer the questions you might have. So, see you there. Step, man. 